Our first arcade title is 1979's Cosmo. Released in Japan by a company called TDS, I could find very little information about it online. 1979 saw more than a few Space Invader clones, but Cosmo is closer to Galaxian, released the same year, but with enough variety that it's worth examining on its own. Unsurprisingly, the enemy sprites are simple and largely single-colored, though unlike many games prior to Galaxian, the sprites are actually colored, not relying on a screen overlay as in Space Invaders. The action is fast and frantic, forcing the player to keep moving to avoid destruction, though the enemy ship patterns are simple enough once you've seen them. It definitely doesn't look as nice as Galaxian, but there's more variety in each wave. Enemy sprites are different, and their attack patterns are very different, though in general they'll fly around the screen until they decide to take a dive at you. One nice touch is that after every wave you get a little trophy in the corner to track your progress. While it's generally accepted that the first real boss in video games comes in 1980's Phoenix, in Cosmo there are enemy waves that serve the role of mini-boss, presenting you with a single tougher enemy to beat. That too was an unexpected element of a relatively unknown and simple game. As far as the sound and visuals go, unfortunately what you see here is an imperfect emulation. I've seen the real game, and it features multiple hardware improvements like moving star fields in the background instead of a blank void. As I can't really judge those elements based on what I've played, I'll leave that out of my evaluation. It's no Galaxian or Asteroids, but it is a fun enough game with some unexpected, if interesting, complexity. I'll give Cosmo a B ranking. Bombi was the sequel to Namco's Pinball Breakout Hybrid GB, and so similar that if we were covering the first in this series, we probably wouldn't even be talking about it. However, while GB was released to US arcades, Bombi never was, so here we are. There are a few improvements over the earlier title, notably a greater use of color, but perhaps of even more important note is that it was the first collaboration between Namco and Nintendo where the latter company licensed a version of the game for its own arcade hardware. Both Bombi and its predecessor are also noteworthy as early creations of Toru Iwatani, who would go on to create the far more popular game Pac-Man. Iwatani had joined Namco to work on pinball titles, but they'd assigned him to design video games instead. These hybrid games were his compromise. While it's easy to see what Iwatani was going for here, it's also easy to see why neither Bomb B nor its predecessors were the hits Namco wanted them to be. On the one hand, the game provides one of the more interesting layouts for the paddle-based breakout game and pinball configurations that wouldn't be possible on a physical table. On the other hand, paddle games had been around for nearly a decade at this point, and Breakout for two years. With the advent of Space Invaders the year before, video game players had shown that they were ready to move on to new kinds of games, and fans of pinball had real tables to turn to. In terms of playability, I personally found Bombi's paddles inconveniently small, though that may be more of a reflection of my skills. Taking all of the above into account, I'll give Bombi a C rating. Field goal is Taito's 1979 contribution to the breakout clone market, this time dressed up as a sports game. Your paddle, as always, appears at the bottom of the screen, while arcs of football helmets and three rings begin to rotate at the top. These are the blocks you need to destroy, blue, yellow, and red, to reach the goal at the top center of the screen. Each row of helmets is, as you might expect, worth successively more points, and you get a bonus for each row that you clear. The goal itself starts out as worth 300, but as you play, a football player will occasionally pop up midfield. Hitting them with the ball adds the value of their jersey times 100 to the goal's value. If it exceeds 1,000, it'll alternate with the word extra. If you can time your field goal to hit when this is displayed, you get an extra life. As with all games of this type, the ball's speed accelerates as you play. In field goal, however, this isn't tied to the game clock or the number of times it's bounced, but is instead relatively random, leading to an uneven and chaotic feel of progression. There's also something about the graphics and font that makes the game look even more primitive than others of its era. Maybe this is just poor aesthetic choices, but I found the clashing red, blue, and yellow on green difficult to look at after a while. As a breakout game, it's not too bad, no Arkanoid, but brings a little something extra to the genre. It might have even been impressive in 1977 or 78, but this is a 1979 game released by the same company that had released Space Invaders the year before. 
It's forgettable, and Taito can do better. I give it a D. Dai 3 Wakase, the third planet meteor, is a fresh take on the fixed screen formula that adds a nice bit of complexity to the game, coming to us from Sun Electronics, the company that would eventually come to be known as Sunsoft. At first glance, the playfield is a cluttered mess filled with colored ellipses, a large planet, a helpfully leveled base for the player, and a number of invader-style aliens marching back and forth at the top of the screen. Our ship has the ability to move the entire span of the screen, blocked only by the ellipses, which I believe are the titular meteors, able to shoot them to clear the way. We can likewise shoot in four directions, allowing us to flank our invaders as they descend. In a way, the action reminds me of William's Centipede to be released the next year. The invaders stop and change direction when they hit meteors, which take the role of mushrooms. Though, of course, in Centipede, your gun can only fire up screen, and the Centipede can't shoot back at you. A final new element we see here is damage to our ship. If hit, we don't die, but instead our engines are damaged, first slowing us and then preventing us from firing. To repair, we need to retreat to our base for a short time to heal up. Now for the negatives. The graphics, as you can see, are primitive and presented in black and white with the simple color band screen overlays you expect to see in older games. I might have given Die 3 Wakase a pass if it had been released in 1978, but technology moves fast in the golden age of arcade games. I'd still be leaning towards a B ranking on the strength of its innovations, but the game's pace is slow as well, and the action on the screen surprisingly minimal for its complex layout. Other than the invader that happens to be shooting at you, nothing much is happening over much of the screen's real estate. Part of this is the fault of the meteors, there's just no reason to clear a path to most of the play area. I'm going to give Dai 3 Wakase a C ranking. Yosako to Donbei, or Yosako and Donbei, is a twist on the Space Invaders formula. This time, the player is a farmer trying to shoot crows out of a tree while his lumberjack buddy cuts it down. A larger bird will occasionally fly by overhead, fulfilling the role of Space Invaders' saucer. The art is primitive, even for 1979, with blocky sprites and simple color overlays over black and white graphics. Still, the idea of mapping Space Invaders into a game about chopping down a tree is clever, and it plays much better than the only other tree-chopping game I can think of, 1983's Force for the Atari 2600. The enemy here are arranged into a pyramid rather than a rectangle, and every time they reach the side of the screen, your lumberjack buddy manages to chop out a section of the trunk, lowering it. However, the birds have this disconcerting ability to blink in and out of existence, and their shots, acorns or bird poop or whatever it is, fall from the tree without much regard for where the birds are in it. It's also somewhat difficult to tell at times where the player is, particularly if you're overlapping the lumberjack. The game's difficulty comes from poor design at times, and there's no grace period after death and you can swiftly just walk back into enemy fire, which I did repeatedly. So, interesting? Yes. Pleasing to the eyes? No. Fun to play? Also no. Yosako to Danbei gets a D ranking. QDQ is the third game in the GB trilogy, released the same year as Toru Awatani's second game in the series, Bombi. Like the first two, it's a block breaker with elements of pinball. Aside from the visuals, the game does provide innovations over Bombi, far in excess of its predecessor's differences from GB. Most notable are the character sprites, the first to appear in a Namco game, and a clear foreshadowing of the more popular kawaii look in Iwatani's next project, Pac-Man. The gameplay effect of the paddles is different as well. Hitting the lower panels regenerates the rainbow brick formations and increases the number of Minimon on the screen. While the fundamentals remain unchanged, QDQ, named after the Clearance Clearwater Revival song Suzy Q, offers a cleaner playfield and more satisfying play experience without looking too cluttered. And the graphics are less primitive looking than its predecessors. Given the improvements, I can see fit to giving the game a B rating. Still no Galaga, but better than the average 1979 arcade title. At first glance, you might think that Space Launcher is another one of those fixed shooters inspired by Space Invaders and Galaga, and you'd be forgiven for thinking so because it does have the marching chorus lines of aliens at the top of the screen. 
while your launcher scrolls bottom left to right. Nintendo's already released two Space Invaders clones after all, uh, Space Fever and SF High Splitter. Sure, it looks a little different with those sparks in the middle of the screen and the roof on top, but Space Fever had blocks of aliens bumping into each other, and SF High Splitter had the extra wide aliens that split into two when you shot them, and that didn't save them from being fundamentally Space Invaders. So your expectations might not be high until you press the fire button. At this point, your entire ship begins to accelerate, and you realize you're not the cannon, you're the missile. In Space Launcher, you need to pilot your missile to the docking base at the top of the screen, Frogger style, avoiding enemy fire and the sparks or mines or whatever those are in the center. Once there, you need to return back to the bottom of the screen. When you reach the level of the aliens, your rocket generates a small shield enabling you to plow through them. If you hit them head on, a side swipe will still kill you. Each mission to the bays and backs makes the game slightly more difficult with more mines and faster enemy ships that fire more often. The difficulty curve is well plotted though and gradual enough that it isn't jarring while being definitely present. You'll reach a point where you lose a number of ships in quick succession, but it doesn't feel as though the game has suddenly gotten too hard, it's just that you've reached the furthest point of your skill. The graphics are simple, but not unappealing. Using the solid color band screen overlays for sprites seen in a number of other games of the sort, and the music isn't grating, which for a late 70s games is the best we can really hope for. It's really a shame we didn't get this title in the US. I easily found it as fun to play as Galaga and Asteroids. I'll happily give Space Launcher Matter of Import's first A ranking. I might have even gone for the S, but there's a, a hollowness here, an emptiness. Maybe it's a little too simple. Skylove is another 1979 fixed screen shooter, this one from OEC. The player controls just like the gun in Space Invaders, though the enemy waves are vastly different. There are only a handful of enemies on the screen at a time, and each has its own movement pattern, a different means of darting across the screen while you try to shoot at them. In early waves, you simply need to kill one of each, but as you go on, you face more foes, though only ever one of each type, and all types are present at the start of each round. The graphics in Skylove are particularly primitive, blocky even by 1979 standards, and monochrome with colored screen overlays. Despite this, the gameplay isn't that bad, with enemy ships moving and darting in quick patterns, difficult to anticipate and only getting faster. A nice touch here is that you can, if you can manage it, hit the enemy ship's fire with your own. Taking the decidedly simple graphics and decent enough gameplay into account, Sky Love is a solid C title for 1979's arcade offering. Nothing terrible, but nothing special, and certainly no competition for the year's stronger coin-op cabinets. Monkey Magic is a blockbusting game from Nintendo in 1979 that deviates pretty far from the breakout standard in a way that doesn't entirely work. While the block layout is fairly constant as a monkey's head, the rules go through a number of changes as the game progresses. At first, you can't break any blocks. A bold stance for a blockbuster. Instead, you see these three arrows that you need to hit to drive them up into the monkey's head. You don't need to push all three up, but as soon as any one of them penetrates its chin, all of them vanish and we find ourselves in the second segment. Ready to break some bricks? The sides of the monkey's jaw vanish, allowing you access to its teeth, if you can get around the bottom of its jaw. There aren't many teeth to knock out, but it largely behaves as you'd expect. Hit them and they're gone. After that, in segment three, the jaw vanishes and we enter the second to last phase. But instead of breaking blocks, our ball changes the color of the monkey's face and toggles its eyes from X's to O's. If you can make them both O's, the chin reappears, but only to bounce your ball up to the top of the screen. Monkey's face is green, we move on to the final stage. As with the teeth stage, we want to eliminate the monkey's hat. And that's it! We can do it again, this time with more of those little monkey head bumpers that divert your ball. The game loops endlessly in this manner. So, evaluation. I'm disappointed, especially after Space Launcher. 
The graphics are simplistic, the gameplay isn't terribly engaging, while the precision required is somewhat reminiscent of pinball, this also draws out each segment unnecessarily. The cardinal sin here seems to be the unnecessary complication of the basic gameplay formula, and earns Monkey Magic a D ranking. Balloon Bomber is a 1980 game from Taito that controls like a fixed screen shooter. The player has a two directional joystick to move left and right, and a button to press to shoot at enemies scrolling by overhead. In this game, you're fighting the titular Balloon Bombers, deployed by a carrier plane at the beginning of each stage. The balloons drift by, left to right, occasionally dropping bombs at you. While you can shoot the bombs out of the air, if you miss, they will blow away a chunk of the ground, limiting your movement and restricting your ability to, to traverse the screen. It's actually pretty innovative and one of the best parts of the game. The damage to the ground persists even after you clear a wave of balloons, the only repairs come when you get hit, and the constant erosion of available play space increases the tension dramatically. Particularly, as your gun can't hit the bombs capable of destroying the edge of the current plot of land. Gameplay is decent, if a little simple, and each wave of balloon gets faster and deploys lower, giving you less time to react to their destruction. In later waves, the carrier plane deploys its own cluster bombs as well, though these, thankfully, don't damage the ground. The difficulty of leading your shots in these conditions lends a nice challenge. Negative marks come from the audio and graphics. Like many prior games, Balloon Bomber is a monochrome sprite game colored by screen overlays, a practice that was old in 1979 and in 1980, the year that Namco releases Pac-Man, it's hard to excuse. It feels like a cabinet that was rushed out at low cost and deemed good enough for the domestic arcades in Japan, but not worth the expense of exporting, even at the height of the Golden Age. Which is exactly what it is. Balloon Bomber gets a C rating. Sky Shooter is a 1980 fixed screen shooter from Irem. The player, a gun on the bottom of the screen, can scroll left and right while firing up at waves of aircraft flying by overhead. When a plane manages to cross, it reappears on another lower level of the screen to continue its journey. You face three types of enemy craft in Sky Shooter. Red biplanes, yellow fighters, and green bombers. The first two, the red and yellow, are smaller craft that drop fast-moving missiles towards you. These can be blown out of the air if you're good enough. The green bombers, though, drop the parachute bombs that Sky Shooter draws its name from. These drift slow until they get low enough and then drop, not to explode, but to sit there like mines and constrict your playfield. While Sky Shooter does have some technical improvements over Balloon Bomber, the last game we played, the sprites are colored rather than monochrome with a fixed overlay, the pacing is far slower. You, your cannon, your shots, the enemy, everything seems to move at a glacial pace. And in fact, the game's challenge primarily comes from the slow speed of your cannon's single shot. Miss, and you'll have to wait a while for it to exit the screen. Unfortunately, this means that I didn't find the game any fun to play, and while the sprites are colored, they are simple and uninspiring. I give Sky Shooter a D rating. As a construction platformer, Taito's 1980 Steelworker is a vast departure from the fixed screen shooters we've been looking at so far. In the game, you control a construction worker. Actually, scratch that. You don't control the construction worker. As in the later NES game, Gumshoe, or the much later Lemmings, the worker strides confidently forward, heedless of danger, while you do your best to create a path of girders to keep them from falling. You have a selection of 10 pieces down to the bottom of the screen, chosen with the joystick, and precious little time to pick the right one to complete the path to the midpoint structure and then the endpoint. You also have a button you can press to get your worker to temporarily walk back from the edge instead of dropping off of it, but you only get a limited number of uses for it. Complicating this is the fact that you can only select a new piece while your worker is crossing the current one, meaning you can't plan out ahead, you can only try to be ready in time. Even worse are the two gantries raising and lowering in the middle of the screen. Their touch is death, and you cannot stop your worker once he begins to cross the central platform. If you think his path will intersect with those gantries, your only option is to use up one of your limited reverses on a prior section and hope that you've timed it right. The game is clearly innovative, of a type yet unseen in the arcade field, maybe a little too much innovation for 1980s, seeing as it was never an export from Japan. The sound and graphics are 
disappointing, audio lifted straight from Space Invaders with the monochrome display and screen overlay style to boot. Still, as a standout pioneer, it astounds me, and after I picked up its controls and the general concept of what I was supposed to be doing, I found it to be actually a lot of fun. I give Steelworker a B rating. Taito's 1980 loop in the third game came at the height of the character's anime and manga popularity. Unfortunately, licensing issues prevented its export to the US. The French IP for the character of Lupin didn't enter the public domain until 2012, but the license holders were content to ignore the anime character as long as it stayed, for the most part, within uh, Japan. The arcade game fits into the maze chase genre. As Lupin, you are to grab bags of money, evading an increasing number of guards and dogs, and bring them to the staging area. Grab all the bags, and you're treated to a cutscene of what looks like Lupin bringing the goods to his love interest. In some cutscenes, she chastises him to bring her more, in others, she rewards his theft with love. The maze in each stage is the same, and arranged around UI elements such as your score and M energy, which I can only assume stands for mental energy, which is consumed when you activate your panic button, a hyperspace-like feature that teleports you from where you are to elsewhere in the maze. Sometimes it doesn't move you at all. Sometimes it throws you right where you want to be. The figures in the maze come in three types. First, there's this guy with a stick. Uh, Inspector Zanagata, maybe. Uh, he'll chase you, try to cut you off, and generally try to make your day more difficult. The other guys, ordinary guards, I suppose, are a little more random and less direct in their pursuit. Finally, there are guard dogs. These simply run back and forth, but have a habit of stopping when you need to pass through an intersection. Touch any of them and you go to jail. Lose all your lives and you're treated to a losing cutscene of Lupin being sent to prison. As a game, it isn't bad. It's themed well enough for the show and it's certainly playable. It uses screen overlays for color, which isn't great. I'll give it a C rating. Kaiti Takara Sagashi is a 1980 Namco release that translates to underwater treasure hunting. The player's goal is to lower a diver through shark infested waters to the seabed where a number of pots await. Controls are simple while diving. You descend automatically unless you hold the button, and pushing left or right allows you to fire your spear gun in the left or right direction. Shooting the sharks is difficult, however, as both they and your spears are very narrow. It's easy to miss by a mere matter of pixels. Once you hit the bottom, the controls become left or right to walk over the, one of the pots. After you've done so, your rope drops down again to push you down into it. And here you discover whether the pot contains points or a sad death under the sea. Once you find a treasure pot, the boat begins to pull you back up with the same controls as your descent. Make it up and you get the points. Fail and they return the pot to the ocean's floor so you can try again. Once all non-trap pots have been collected, you advance to the next stage with a new pattern of sharks and treasure pots. The game is, unfortunately, monochrome with screen overlays to provide color. It's simple in design and not too difficult to grasp. Trying to get a handle on the shark's speed and overall pattern does provide a bit of challenge, as does the difficulty in hitting them with your spear. Are the pots containing death traps unfair? Absolutely. As far as I can tell, they shovel every stage and show no hints as to which one will kill you. I give Kaite Takara Sagashi a C rating. Hellafire is a 1980 scrolling shooter developed by Nintendo. The player controls a submarine, firing missiles up at helicopters while trying to dodge torpedoes, enemy warcraft, and aquatic mines. The helicopters, in turn, drop missiles and depth charges down towards you. The goal here is simple. Wipe out each wave of ten helicopters before the time runs out, and their attacks become much more dangerous, including dropping depth charges that fire an unavoidable wave of missiles to destroy you. Doing so while avoiding their vertical attacks, the horizontal attacks from the ocean dangers, is quite difficult. Hellafire is a challenging game, but not unfairly so. You need to learn to split your attention to retain a sense of situational awareness. In terms of the visuals, the game is beautiful compared to those we've been reviewing recently. Full color raster sprite and scrolling backgrounds that entice without distracting. It might not be up there with Star Castles or Wizards of War in terms of gameplay, but it is fun for a few rounds. I give Hellifire a B ranking. Indian Battle is an Old West themed fixed screen shooter released by Taito in 1980. 
The player controls a cowboy with a rifle at the bottom of the screen, firing up at waves of Native American warriors who advance towards him, hiding behind rocks and cactus, moving from cover to cover while firing arrows and throwing tomahawks. Occasionally, a bird will fly by overhead, dropping an egg that hatches into a snake or scorpion if it hits the ground without being shot. There's also a Native American that pops up out of the ground to anchor the player in place for a few moments. As the player cannot fire horizontally, only up, the snakes, scorpion, and grabbing Native American cannot be shot, only avoided. Along with the natives that reach the bottom of the screen, though those will quickly return to cover. Each round lasts until you've shot enough enemies, as noted by a counter on the left side of the screen. After you've passed, if you've done well enough, there's a bonus stage where your cowboy attempts to lasso animals. The basic mechanic here is the same, left, right, fire to throw your lasso, but your rope moves slow and takes a long time to cross the screen and return if you miss. This makes careful and patient aim a must if you want to capture the mall before the time runs out. The sprites aren't bad, but it's another monochrome game whose color is provided by an overlay. There is music, a version of Ten Little Indians, which is its own issue, but the game presents with all of the sensitivity you'd expect from a Japanese team covering Native American issues in 1980. I give Indian Battle a C rating. The gameplay isn't boring, but beyond the enemy moving from cover to cover, it's nothing special. Sasuke vs. Commander is a 1980 fixed screen shooter from SNK. As in the last game we discussed, Indian Battle, the player controls a character, not a ship or a cannon. You are a ninja protecting your daimyo from enemy ninja. In the first part of each stage, you need to fire what I assume that shuriken up at flocks of ninja soaring from tree to tree overhead as they throw stars back down at you. First, there's a wave of red ninja, then a larger flock of green ninja that, for some reason, remind me of frogs. As an interesting wrinkle, if you manage to hit a ninja, they fall from the sky to the ground, and yes, you will lose a life if they hit you. After eliminating both waves of ninja, you're taken to the boss stage, where you have to contend with the powerful magic of a ninja boss. The first shoots gouts of flame, the second creates copies of himself, the third throws bolts. After you beat the boss, it's back to the waves of ninja again. That's the flow of the game. It's challenging enough, with a unique theme in the games we've seen so far, and the falling corpses add an unexpected element. Visually, it's quite nice too. The sprites are in full color, if yet small, except for the larger bosses. I give Sasuke vs. Commander a B rating. Draco was released by Spanish developer Sidelsa as a twin stick shooter, similar in superficial ways to Berserk. You run around a two-screen world, trying to accomplish different tasks in different stages. In the first, you need to shoot these bubbles to free the points held within. Touching the walls, the points themselves, or enemies will kill you. In stage two, you need to navigate this maze to collect the point values, which no longer kill you, before the time runs out. After a few tries, I discovered you don't need to collect all of the points, only the highlighted set at the end. In stage three, you need to collect the dots before time runs out. Is there a stage four? Is it different or more of the same? I don't know. I lost interest in the game after playing these first three stages for about 10 minutes. But I could have continued on because Draco allows you to keep playing from the last stage you reached if you insert another quarter. I haven't been able to track down exactly when in 1981 Draco was released, so I can't say for sure if it predates SNK's October release Fantasy, generally regarded as the first arcade game to feature continues, but it is possible. While the graphics are primitive by 1981 standards and the music is certainly nothing special, the innovation of continues, either as early adopters or inventors, is enough that I can see fit to give Draco a C rating. This is Taito's 1981 fixed screen shooter, Space Cruiser. Three, two, one. Your ship can move horizontally and fire vertically, one shot at first, alternating with two after an automatic upgrade. This game is best compared to Galaga, released the same year. How does it stack up? 
On the positive, there's plenty of variety in enemies and formation. We pass through several waves on our way to blow up the enemy planet. The first two are familiar looking mobs of enemy spacecraft, though if we manage to hit one just right it'll flip over and act as a shield temporarily. There's also this larger mothership that takes a few shots to kill. Between stages we see this uh, galaxy map showing us what comes up ahead, and that's also pretty cool and a bit innovative. And it reminds me a little bit of Star Fox for the Super Nintendo for some reason. The enemies flit about in deceptive patterns, making them difficult to lead with your shots, and this is another title where you only get one, later two, shots on the screen at a time. You also feel slower than in some shooters, though the pacing is not overall too bad. After a few waves of disc-like enemies, we enter an asteroid belt. Here the goal is simply to travel far enough without getting killed to activate the slip speed warning. At this point, we'll start to rise from the bottom of the screen as it changes color, making dodging more difficult. One nice touch is that if you do die, you don't have to start a wave over from the very beginning. You only face the foes you haven't destroyed, and if you lose all of your lives... Well, this is one of those 1981 games with continues, and that makes it a lot less frustrating. After the asteroid stage, you get up to a friendly space station that you'll need to dock with after dealing with a few opportunistic enemy ships. Docking gives you the game's sole power-up, an attachment to the front of your ship that gives you additional firepower, allowing you to fire two blasts every second shot. The last phase is the enemy planet. After dealing with a few defensive craft and the missile ports in the moon, you at last fire a planet buster from the nose of your ship, destroying the planet once and for all. Well, maybe not for all, because now the game repeats with you tackling the stages in the same order yet again. While Space Cruiser does have some nice action to it, at the same time the design doesn't feel quite as holistic as in something like Galaga. There's a little too much variety, and it doesn't really come together into something cohesive. The graphics are also a little bit on the basic side. The score, Night on Bald Mountain, a 19th century Russian piece made famous by Disney's Fantasia, but perhaps more familiar to retro gamers as the what-the-heck level music used in Earthworm Jim, isn't a bad rendition given the technological limitations. Compared to Galaga, Space Cruiser just comes up short, though I do give it props for its enemy variety and continue system. I'll give it a B ranking. Streaking is a 1981 maze game from Shoei with mechanics superficially similar to Pac-Man. You run around a maze, eating dots, and avoiding enemies trying to catch you. Only in Streaking, the enemies are cops instead of ghosts, and you are playing a naked woman. Yep. There are a few twists that make the game unique. Instead of power pellets in the corners, uh, there are single-shot teleporters that zap you to the opposite corner when used, and instead of fruit or pretzels, you collect clothing items to dress yourself. This doesn't make the police chasing you any more inclined to let you go, of course, but it does make the game slightly less embarrassing to play if your parents happen to be watching. There's a mechanic to the dots as well. While your ultimate goal in any board is to collect them all and move on to the next identical maze, you also accrue fatigue as you run around. Max out your fatigue bar and you'll lose a life just as if the cops had caught you. Eating helps relieve the bar. As far as the art and music go, it's far less charming than 1981's Miss Pac-Man, the game we have to compare it to, though also presented in a cartoonish kawaii kind of style. The maze feels less well designed, and the gameplay is a little rough. You can't tell the police apart, so there's no strategy possible based on their AI, if they even have individual AI. I'd give the game a higher rating if there were some variation like clothing making you slower, but the cops less interested in chasing you, but there isn't. It's just a subpar maze chase game with a mildly salacious theme, so I give it a D ranking. El Fin del Tiempo is a 1981 Spanish arcade game from Nimer that presents a dog's dinner of clashing shooter gameplay styles in an attempt to provide a little bit of everything, but instead offering up a whole lot of nothing. The graphics are primitive, the sound basic, and the gameplay is clunky. In the end, it promises much, but delivers very little. 
After an opening sequence showing a UFO bombing a city, we're treated to a generic arcade fanfare before being tossed into the first level. Gameplay here is faintly reminiscent of Konami's Scramble. We can orient our ship in up to eight directions while we're dragged relentlessly forward as the stage scrolls. It doesn't feel so much like you're flying as you are choosing a direction to point your ship, and once you've adapted to that, the game becomes a little easier. Complicating matters is the fuel mechanic that drops quickly. You need to constantly shoot little tankers to stay alive while dodging missiles. At the end of the stage, we find a space station we can enter to refuel, though why is a mystery. The game largely abandons the mechanic after this stage, and we find ourselves instead on a fixed screen with an orb we can't shoot, and an endless supply of crashing meteors to avoid until the 45 second clock runs out. We can shoot the flaming rocks, but honestly our ship feels so large and ponderous that avoiding them is a matter of luck rather than skill. If a meteor crashes on screen, it'll rise up as a rocket to be avoided shortly after. We do, in this stage, have a secondary gun, a twin laser cannon. Like the fuel mechanic, it only exists here and doesn't add much to the experience. The next stage sees us transform from a little robot thing floating next to our space station while weird tentacles rise from the ground and a smaller satellite orbits, shooting us, and another countdown clock appears. This time, if the time runs out, we lose a life. And it took me a few tries to figure out that what we need to do is to grab these little wedges and bring them up to our station to pass the level. From here we go on to another fixed screen shooter stage, this one reminiscent of Nintendo's radar scope. Though here the 3D effect is far less sophisticated and we simply have to eliminate all of the aliens to move on. Stage 5 gives us the cityscape from the opening animation, the mothership, and several saucers to shoot. Once they're destroyed, the mothership drops its city's destroying payload, and we have to shoot it to beat the cycle. From here, it's back to round 1 with a few more enemies to make the game more complicated. What it feels like is a shooter whose developers tried to jam in every mechanic they liked from the last few years of arcade development without any real regard for how or why those mechanics worked, needlessly including elements like the fuel meter, the grabbing arm, or the secondary cannon that would be used for one stage and then abandoned. It feels like a jumbled mess of an anthology more than an actual enjoyable game, made difficult chiefly by how poorly your ship handles and how unnatural it feels. I've reviewed titles that felt less like a game and more like a tech demo, but seldom have I encountered something so poorly designed, ugly, and unpleasant to play. Elfin Del Tiempo, released in 1981, the same year we got Donkey Kong, Galaga, Frogger, Centipede, and Miss Pac-Man, it's Matter of Import's first F ranking, and may God have mercy on its soul. Today's game is Taito's 1981 Frog and Spiders, a fixed screen shooter where the player controls a frog as he shoots at spiders on a web slung between two trees. It controls like many other fixed shooters, you can move left, right, and shoot, with the addition of a jump button to help you leap over the snakes that will occasionally slither by from opposite sides of the screen. Why is a frog shooting? Why are the spiders and bees you face shooting back? I don't know, maybe coating your frog tongue was too complex, but it seemed like a waste to invoke a frog and bugs without letting you actually eat any of them. In a twist that reminds me of Suzuki vs. Commander, if you shoot a spider once they don't die, they just fall out of the web toward you, and upon hitting the ground will eventually emerge from the holes in the trees on either side to rejoin the web. The bee enemy likewise has a slightly interesting mechanic. Shoot their hive and a trio will fly out to harrow you for a while. But in the end, slightly interesting is the best I can say about Frog and Spiders. Maybe I'd think more highly of it if it had come out the year earlier, but by the end of 1981 we'd already seen many of the classic Golden Age titles, notably Frogger, and Frog and Spiders just pales in comparison. I give the game a D ranking. Today we're covering Taito's 1981 release, Space Seeker. It's a very different sort of game, almost an arcade war game. Each of your ships is dispatched from a central base to fly over a planetary landscape holding three types of objects. Planetoids that stun you, squadrons of ships appearing as red dots, and these mobile bases. 
To engage with any of them, you need to move your ship's icon into them. From here, it transitions to one of two types of gameplay depending on what you've encountered. Ship squadrons are engaged with in a first-person dogfight. You control the ship guns, firing towards the enemies coming your way, and while they don't fire back, they will destroy you if they come in contact with your cannons. Despite the overlay, the rest of your ship doesn't exist as a game object. The enemy fighters will scroll to the top of the screen harmlessly if they exit from the bottom. While you can move your guns horizontally left to right, you can also move your firing patterns up and down the screen, though it lacks any kind of targeting reticle. Wipe out all the ships, and you'll be returned to the campaign map. The bases are another matter. First, they can fire at you on the map, and will destroy you if they hit, so be careful. And once you reach them, you'll be sent into a side-scrolling shooter level, where you have both forward cannons and bombs to target the waves of ships or missiles defending the base. This is a much harder sort of stage, because they do come at you fast. Take them all out, and you'll get a short tunnel sequence through the base, and if you make it through that, the base itself will be removed from your map. So, that's Space Seeker. A difficult game, though not impossible, with some unique and innovative mechanics that actually seems to work to add as an arcade title. If the graphics and sound were up to par with 1981's other releases, and the gameplay a little more smooth, it might be worth an A ranking. But, as it is, I'll give it a B. Today's game is Wall Street, a weird little action game from Century Electronics with two distinct and very different stages. The first is a variation on the sort of gameplay seen in Exidy's Circus. You control a pair of firemen with a rescue trampoline trying to catch Wall Street investors as they throw themselves out of windows on the left side of the screen. If you manage to catch them, they'll bounce back up into the air, so the goal is to aim them towards the ambulance on the right side of the screen. Miss, and you'll lose a life. Succeed, and you'll start filling the central bank building with colored lines. If you manage to fill it completely, you'll move on to the next stage. Working against you is the shrinking bar at the bottom of the screen representing the Dow Jones Index. If it empties before you fill the bank, you'll also lose a life, and have to start over. The second stage is a top-down maze where the player must run around, grabbing bags of money and trying to deposit them while being chased by tanks. If you can destroy or avoid them long enough to bring all the money where it needs to go, the game returns to the next version of the first stage again, where things are moving faster and you have less time to complete it. Once again, what we have with Wall Street are two very different sorts of gameplay that just don't mesh well together. While neither is truly terrible, they're just lacking in that sense of unity that makes a game feel like a cohesive whole, either practically or thematically. As far as presentation goes, the graphics aren't terrible, but the music is a little harsh and repetitive for 1981. The game does, however, feature digitized voice effects at the beginning of the round. They're not great effects, even for the era, but they are there. After some thought, I think I'll give Wall Street a C ranking. Today's game is Azurian Attack, a rare example of a fixed screen shooter that allows the player to maneuver in eight directions with the joystick rather than being anchored to the bottom of the screen. Modded from the Galaxian arcade board by New Zealand developer Rate Electronics, it uses many of the same sound samples untouched, but gameplay feels very different and less cohesive. If anything, Azurian Attack suffers from comparison to the game that it was constructed from. The sprites are tiny, the graphics aren't great, and worst of all, your ship controls without any semblance of inertia or velocity. It simply moves where you send it, stopping on a dime when you center the joystick. Your attack is very narrow as well, since you can only face the eight compass directions the joystick provides. This leaves huge gaps in your arc of fire. The game alternates between two screens with fairly divergent gameplay. In the first, you face waves of small, fast-moving enemies, each with a different appearance and attack pattern, that attack in small groups from off-screen. After you defeated a sufficient number, you're taken to the other screen, featuring endless waves of scrolling space debris between you and your mothership. No enemies appear to harass you here, but instead you need to battle your janky ship's controls to try to clear a path all the way to the top of the screen. It is, unfortunately, a frustrating play experience, difficulty not coming from the skill of the opponent's ships or the AI, but the ineptitude of the game's design. 
The art is primitive, and even the sound, ripped from Galaxian, isn't used to its greatest effect. It may, in fact, be the worst shooter released in the 80s. And I'm going to go ahead and give it the rare F ranking. Portman, also known as Docman, is a 1982 Taito arcade game distributed by Nova in Canada, but never made its way south into the United States. It's the rare game in which the player takes on the role of a stevedore, grabbing luggage that falls off the dock and tossing it up onto a passing ship. Parcels fall singly, in pairs or three at a time, and to catch them you have to intercept their fall and press the button at the right time. Pressing it again will have your steve door hurl them up and onto the ship, which slowly drifts left to right above you, aiming to build sacks of four. Of course, the heavier the sack you catch, the more slowly you'll move, and the more slowly you'll hurl them back up onto the ship. If you miss the ship's hold, or if you try to fill it past capacity, the excess luggage will bounce off into the water. There is no penalty for this, or for missing a set of luggage completely, but as it takes you longer to load the ship, your bonus for doing so drops, and if you run out of luggage on the dock before you fill the hold, the game ends. The game also ends if you run out of lives, endangered both by roaming loading machines and a guy standing on the ship hurling boulders at you. Why he's there and why he's throwing giant rocks at you, I couldn't say, but if you manage to fill the hold despite him, a woman will come onto the screen and kick him into the water, something that's satisfying to watch. Once fully loaded, the game will take you to a second gameplay screen where you are the one throwing stones, this time to try and knock down boxes of dynamite. Catch them and you're good, miss and they'll blow up sections of the floor. I feel that Portman just misses the mark here. There are some good puzzle mechanics in the way that throwing the luggage stacks feels, but the game doesn't commit to them, instead cleaving to the idea of being an action arcade game in a way that doesn't quite work. Still, it does feel like a very near miss. I give Portman a D ranking. Hot Shocker is a 1982 arcade game produced by Italian publisher E.G. Feligo that's nowhere near as rude as the title makes it out to be. The player takes on the role of a lineman named Dudley as he runs along telephone wire laying it out in a spiderweb pattern. Also inhabiting the line web are hotspot sparks that will pursue Dudley and kill him with a touch, and a trio of goonie birds that will temporarily daze him while the sparks speed up. At a glance, the game brings to mind line-laying games like Amadar, though you're not trying so much to capture geographic regions as you are trying to change the color of the lines. This is fundamental to maze chase games like Pac-Man, where traversal of the maze is marked by devouring dots. While on the first level, you're turning it from a dark blue to a brighter red, after that the lines are invisible until you've passed along them, but the maze structure remains the same. And, as in Pac-Man, you'll get a power-up in the form of a telephone. Answer it, not only will the sparks vanish, but you'll be able to catch the Goonie Birds. Do so and they'll get vanish for a while, plus they give you more line to lay. This is a good thing, as in later levels you won't have nearly enough to cover the maze as it lies. Visually, Hot Shocker fits in well with other earlier 80s arcade titles, with a cartoonish look for Dudley and the Goonie Birds. The developers were able to get around the need for a detailed backdrop with the black background against which the lines stand out well. The gameplay isn't bad, but it lacks the depth found in other maze games. The birds and sparks don't lend themselves to the same tactical choices found in Pac-Man's Ghosts, and while the theme of laying lines is fairly unique, it doesn't have the same sort of draw. I give Hot Shocker a C ranking. Alibaba and the Forty Thieves is a 1982 Sega maze chase game based on the Arabian legend of the same name. The game begins with a cutscene where the protagonist steals seven bags of gold from the thieves and secures it in his own vault. While the game has thematic similarities to Taito's 1980 Lupin III, the goal here is the opposite. The thieves are after your treasure, which you need to defend by stopping them before they can grab it and return it to their own vault. If they manage to grab all of your bags, you lose a life. You also lose a life if you're caught by the Red Thief, who chases you around the maze. You can hold him off by dropping brief explosives, though he cannot be harmed this way. The other thieves can be defeated easily enough by running into them before or after they've stolen your treasure. 
the challenge coming from the fact that you're facing a whole gang of three or four at a time. In the center of the screen is the counter of remaining thieves, and once you've defeated all 40 of them, you move on to the next stage. The physical layout will be the same, but the enemies move faster, and eventually you'll face multiple copies of the deadly red thief. Occasionally, four question marks will appear in the center of the screen, and touching them either gives you a power-up that lets you move twice as fast for a brief time, or takes you one of the two bonus stages. In the first, all but the central maze disappears, and you're chased by a giant red thief while singular normal thieves move around through the void to try to grab your treasure. In the second, you're the giant, able to dispatch the red thief the only time in the game you have such an ability. Alibaba and the 40 Thieves is a very different approach to the maze chase genre that puts the player in the role of the chaser defending treasures instead of trying to capture them. It has depth without losing its fundamental simplicity, and the opening cutscene is a nice touch. The visuals are plain for 1982, however, and it lacks the polish and charm of Ms. Pac-Man, released the same year, and suffers a bit for the comparison. I'm going to give the game a C ranking. Today's title is the arcade game Skybase, a fixed screen shooter released in 1982 by Amori Electric Company. Players control their ship with a two-way joystick and two buttons, one for main guns and one for a pair of missiles. These attacks travel at the same speed and differ only significantly in a few stages. In the first stage, players face a simulated Raster 3 tunnel from which enemies emerge, attacking as they do so. Bugs and purple diamonds that get bigger as they near the edge of the screen to approximate a depth effect. It brings to mind Atari's 3D vector shooter Tempest, but in a much less effective and entertaining way, as the player is still anchored to the bottom of the screen, and raster sprites can't really capture the same sort of intensity. Skybase's audio isn't great, but it's worst in the stages where it sounds like nothing more than a glitching sound chip. After that's been endured for long enough, the second stage brings the player to a meteor shower where space rocks zigzag towards the bottom of the screen, accompanied by classic falling object sounds. The meteors are hard to hit despite their size due to their rapid movement. Stage 3 pits the player against a small number of, I guess, space dragons that take multiple shots to drop. Once you do, they'll descend with rapid speed, destroying you if they come into contact with you. Note that in this phase you do not have use of your missiles. The final stage pits the player against the eponymous Sky Base, taking the form of a slowly descending curve at the top of the screen from which missiles drop as the player passes below them. Avoid getting struck long enough and it'll have lowered to the point where the various targets are visible, missile launchers and a shielded vulnerability point that opens and shut. Do enough damage and you're given some bonus points and a round end screen where your ship flies off into the distance at which point you start over on the first stage. Skybase is a hard game with a lot of enemy fire on the screen and fast moving foes to contend with. Given how few controls your ship has, left, right, missiles, gun, you don't have a lot of options to engage with it, and honestly the stage to stage interstitial where you fly off into the distance isn't that great of a reward. So I will give Skybase a D ranking. The Bounty is yet another arcade cabinet from Orca, this one a 1982 vertically scrolling shooter. You control a boat, heading down a river, avoiding enemy craft, gun emplacement, turtles, whirlpools, and mines. Are you after a bounty? Is the title of the game an obscure reference to the 1962 movie or the real-life mutiny that inspired it? No idea, because this isn't the kind of game that gives you a story. Your goal here is to travel upriver as far as possible and accrue as many points as you can before your lives run out. If you make it all the way to the lock at the end, you're given bonus points and taken to the next level. The river is the same, but the enemies are faster. In terms of controls, you have a joystick and two buttons, one to thrust and one to shoot. Constant thrust is necessary to prevent your ship from floating back down the river, though not so constant that you crash into the banks of islands and explode. This involves, in some cases, some careful threading of the needle. Your guns don't shoot very far, only perhaps two boat lengths ahead, 
but you do get a three-way spread, which helps in that you don't need to accelerate into enemy gunfire to take out the towers. You also face hostile boats that shoot back at you, but thankfully they only have a single cannon to your three. Other hazards and features including logs to avoid, buoy flags to capture for points, and whirlpools that temporarily immobilize you. There are also turtles, but I wasn't quite able to really get a firm handle on how they impact gameplay. Finally, there are oil drums that, when collected, add to the fuel that you're constantly burning. Visually, the bounty is simple, perhaps even crude, even for 1982. It does have a musical score, but it's much more repetitive than catchy, and the other sound effects are both limited and muted. Ultimately, the presentation is as limited as the gameplay. There just isn't enough variety in the bounty to make it worth playing. I give it a D ranking. Sky Army is a horizontally scrolling shooter from Shoei that places the player in a helicopter during a war between cities. Action occurs in three distinct stages. In the first, you battle against opponent helicopters and jets on a fixed screen, firing at them with rockets and dropping bombs directly below you. Occasionally, a helicopter will fly out with a section of bridge that, if placed to span the gaps between the land on the right and left edges of the screen, allows the enemy forces to invade, killing you just as dead if you'd been shot or collided with an enemy craft. For their part, the enemy choppers hover in mid-air before making passes at you, and a fast-moving jet will occasionally swoop past. This stage ends when you've defeated a set number of opponents. At this point, the game becomes a more traditional scrolling shooter as you traverse the distance to your own base, facing yet more helicopters, jets, storm clouds, and the occasional fixed missile platform. The goal here is simply to cover the required distance to get you to the third stage. Stage 3 bookends the first. While still a fixed screen scenario, here you're the one building the bridge while fending off the opposition. A craft will appear at the top of the screen with a section of bridge, and you can take this by hovering next to them for a moment. Once the piece has been passed, you can place it by hovering above the place it needs to go and slowly descending. At this point, a worker will appear to fix it in place. Of course, enemy helicopters and jets will harrow you the whole time, this time the jets dropping bombs will have to be destroyed towards your bridge. Build it the whole way across and you'll get a victory animation celebrating your feat before the game cycle starts anew from the first stage. Sky Army works as a concept, it works as a game. The action is fierce but manageable, the stage variety is still cohesive enough to work as a whole, and the art and music are decent for the era. It's a solid game that would fit in well in any Golden Age arcade. I give it a B ranking. Today's game, Strike Bowling, is a two-player trackball bowling game released by Taito in 1982. The controls are simple. Roll sideways to position your ball, then a sharp up to throw. You have the option to pre-select some spin for your throw, and you can add a little mid-roll, but for the most part if you aim for the right spot between the 1 and 2 or 1 and 3 pins, you can score a strike. <laughs> if only real bowling was this consistent. Otherwise, the only difference between strike bowling and any other arcade bowling game are the animated cheerleaders dancing off to the side. Does professional bowling have cheerleaders? I think not, Taito. I think not. Being a very, very average, almost elemental bowling game, I give Strike Bowling a middle-of-the-lane C ranking. Talbot was an early 1982 maze game produced by Alpha Denshi, a company that would later go on to find success producing games like World Heroes for SNK. In Talbot, you play a rabbit breeder whose bunnies have escaped. You have to recapture them with the help of your faithful dog, a Talbot, the breed for whom the game is named, before the poachers capture them. Each round plays out a little bit like Alibaba or Lupin, but with rabbits instead of bags of treasure. You and the computer-controlled poachers try to grab as many of the rabbits as possible before the round's time runs out. If you have more, you win and move on to the next round. The more rabbits you collect, the more slowly you move, and if you come into contact with poachers anywhere but in your own hutch, where they can try to steal the rabbits you've already collected, you lose a life. You do have the aid of your faithful dog, though, who is roaming the maze with you. With the tap of a button, you can extract him to set a trap that will slow down the rabbits or poachers that pass through it. 
While the graphics are a bit primitive for a 1982 arcade title, the premise is certainly unique, as is the mechanic of the independent dog character wandering the map with you. It's by no means a great game, but I think it's worth playing once or twice. I give Talbot a C ranking. Jolly Jogger is a 1982 arcade game from Taito that falls into the Maze Chase category, though closer to Amadar than Pac-Man. As the jogger, you connect lines while evading the thugs trying to catch you. Each square you successfully mark off completes a part of the design with the goal of finishing it before the long fuse to a bomb burns off and ends the round. Having to close off all four sides of each square rather than simply claiming larger tracts of territory adds difficulty to your task, though thankfully the enemy doesn't destroy you if they touch the lines you leave behind. Further, like in Pac-Man, there are special squares that give you the power to turn the tables on your foes for a short time once you've walled them off. Despite somewhat simple sprites for 1982, Jolly Jogger is actually fun to play, one of those games I think could have done well in the US if they'd bothered to distribute it here. Perhaps Taito simply didn't think jogging in the park while being pursued by thugs would have found resonance with American arcade audiences, but to be honest, with a lot of these early games, the story and context is less important than the gameplay. The sound isn't half bad either, it's a welcome spin on the maze grid genre, and I give the game a B ranking. Another simple, quickly produced arcade title from Orca that never left Japan, in Marine Boy you play a diver collecting dolphins and mermaids from the depths. At the beginning of each stage you dive into the water, swimming vertically down along a trench wall, avoiding or killing most of the sea life you encounter. Dolphins and mermaids give you points when you collect them. The other fish, eels, killer whales, and crabs will kill you with a touch. Jellyfish are a special case, they merely sting and paralyze you for a short time. Your weapon against these beasts is some kind of... I don't know, it kind of looks like that Looney Tunes extending boxing glove thing, but it's probably a knife or a spear or something. It doesn't extend too far from the body, but you can swing it around as you turn and hit the sea creatures menacing you. You've also got an oxygen meter for each stage, but it doesn't seem to deplete fast enough to be much of a factor, at least not in the early levels I bothered to play. When you reach the bottom of the trench, you'll find a giant clamshell that contains a larger mermaid. Reach her and you'll get bonus points for all of your remaining oxygen and for each mermaid collected along the way. For a game that's one long extended water level, the controls aren't too bad. The sprites are in the same cartoony orca style that feels just a little bit dated in 1982, and you do get to see new sea creatures every level, but the gameplay itself is too simple to really be engaging, and not in that addictive way. Feels more like a near miss than their other titles, but a miss is still a miss. I give Marine Boy a D ranking. Time Tunnel is a 1982 arcade game from Taito that has nothing to do with the late 60s television series. The action puzzle game was never released in an arcade cabinet outside Japan, but it did see a Nintendo Switch eShop release in 2019. I considered avoiding titles that saw modern re-releases with US distribution for the purposes of this series, but to be honest, new ports are coming out all the time, so there's really no way to future-proof for that. And, as far as matter of import goes, if there was no US release port within, say, 20 years of publication, it's fair game. But on to Time Tunnel. The player controls a train passing through the titular Time Tunnel to different eras, connecting cars and collecting passengers while trying to avoid robots, monsters, oncoming trains, and running out of fuel. Controls are interesting. You can go forward or reverse manually, but to change direction you need to press the button to flip the track switch ahead of you rather than directly controlling your turns. Sometimes this means passing a turn up, switching, and then backing up along it, or diverting the path of an oncoming train. This adds a nice puzzle element to Time Tunnel and really cements the feeling that you're controlling a track-bound train. The Taito published games we've covered in this series tend to be of higher quality, and Time Tunnel is no exception. 
The sprites are well made, the gameplay smooth, and the sound, well, it works. It's a fun game, though it lacks the star power of 1982's rival stars like Dig Dug or Qbert, and it definitely fits into the golden age of arcade gaming. I give Time Tunnel a B rating. And today's game is Battlecross, a 1982 scrolling shooter from Omori Electric. Battlecross has multiple stages, beginning with waves of bug-like aliens that come at you in typical shooter formations. They don't react to you or shoot at you, they just move from the right of the screen to the left, and uh, the difficulty coming from your size and lack of maneuverability. Compared to the enemies, you are large in the screen, longer than you are tall, and you move faster back and forth than up and down, making dodging the initial formations a little bit tricky. You can face either left on the screen or right on the screen, so you can't really fire ahead while falling back. Additionally, you don't shoot very fast, only one shot on the screen at a time, and the game does feature continues, but if you die mid-stage, you have to start over. You also have a fuel gauge that continues to deplete, only refueling if you die, meaning you can't really get through a full round of stages without losing a life. In the second stage, you find yourself facing missiles and smaller ships coming from above, below, and the sides, and launched from a small and invincible satellite. Your large size and lack of speed are even greater hindrances here, and, as in the first stage, you just need to kind of dodge around and hope that you outlast the enemy waves. The third stage, you find yourself flying between asteroids armed with mounted cannons. The asteroids do not provide cover either to you or the cannons, but your lack of maneuverability is again the biggest challenge, as there's a lot of vertical shifting, which you're slower at. It's very easy to misjudge where you are and accidentally wreck yourself on one of these asteroids. In the fourth stage, uh, there's what I'm interpreting as a, as a hive. You need to blow away sections of the hive as it drifts from the right of the screen to the left, and it's very easy to end up facing the wrong way while you're shooting. All the while, a worker is repairing the hive, and insects launch at you in fast suicide strikes. This is perhaps the most interesting, if occasionally frustrating, sequence in the game. But it isn't the last. The fifth stage is quick. There's a large laser ship approaching, firing at you, and this might be considered a boss, but you can pretty much take it out in one hit, uh, all the while dodging missiles launched from the bottom of the screen. After this, the stages will cycle, enemies getting slightly faster, extra ships in the last few stages. Uh, like a lot of Amori's games, Battlecross feels cheaper than its contemporaries. The sprites are simple, the music and sound are inspired, the controls are slow and the size of your ship means it isn't actually fun to play, even after you get used to it. I'm going to give Battlecross a D ranking. Universal Video Games' Mighty Monkey is a horizontally scrolling shooter arcade game inspired by the classic Chinese novel Journey to the West. It puts the player into the role of Sun Wukong the Monkey King flying around on his magical cloud. Each stage starts with the player flying through an open sky dotted with clouds that you can pass through but not shoot through. Waves of enemies come at you in patterns similar to other games in the genre. First bugs, then birds, then bats. And, as with many early shooters, they don't react to you, just fly around in their patterns. After a few such waves, the stage stops scrolling automatically and you enter a new sort of terrain. The Great Wall in the first, a skull-scattered hillside in the second, and a cavern in the third. In both phases, the player can face either direction using the joystick, making controls a little tricky. I found myself wishing I could fly backwards while shooting forward, but in the latter phase, the screen scrolls based on your movement. Here we also see the core gameplay gimmick of Mighty Monkey. If an enemy hits the terrain, they turn into a fireball that can't be shot, bringing into play your other power, turning into a flying dragon head. The dragon head can't shoot or eat the normal enemies, but he can eat the fireballs, making switching forms necessary to clear each stage by killing a set number of enemies. While this transformation trick does keep Mighty Monkey from being just another barebones shooter, it isn't enough to really elevate it above mediocre. The graphics are pretty basic and the music, incongruously European public domain tunes like Frere Jaca, gets repetitive. 
Still, it's not the worst game in this series, nor even that bad compared to our other 1982 imports. I give Mighty Monkey a C ranking. Rugian is a scrolling arcade shooter from Sanritsu that has a few interesting perspective tricks, raising it above most of the matter of import titles released in 1982. The game has the player piloting NASA's space shuttle, armed with some kind of missiles, against waves of enemies ruled by what looks like a giant pair of space lips, Rugian, the titular antagonist. As with most shooters of this era, Rugian is broken up into discrete stages, some of which offer slight differences in gameplay, though nothing on the order of Elf and Del Tiempo. The first stage has us flying against waves of enemies descending from the top of the screen, with an effect trying to make it look like they're coming at us in faux 3D that doesn't quite work. The second stage brings a more top-down angle as we fly over the body of a massive starship dodging or shooting missiles. Here we're restricted towards the bottom of the screen, but we gain more depth illusion as this player's sprite grows as we ascend further from the bottom. Disappointingly, there are no features on the ship to target, gun turrets or missile launchers as in Xevious, released the same year. Stage 3 brings us inside the ship, in the biggest departure from form yet and the most interesting sequence. We're inside a forced perspective corridor, firing and dodging oncoming craft, contending with the way the corridor curves and turns. If we stray too far into the wall or floor, we'll start to spark and eventually explode. In some ways, this perspective reminds me of the 1982's much more popular release, Zaxxon. Is this the earliest corridor shooter? Probably not, but it's the first we're covering in this series. The last stage is a return to the perspective of the first, as we face off with Rugian itself, a giant pair of smiling lips that floats around launching smaller craft at you. Initially, Rugian cannot be harmed, only avoided, until he starts sparking and opens up. Blasting him ends the stage and brings you back to the first again, only more difficult, as you do. So first the positives. Rugian plays with perspective in a very cool way for 1982, ranging from nearly top-down to nearly straight ahead. The mirroring of the backdrop in most of the stages to try to create a vanishing point doesn't quite work, but the way sprites change in size as they move vertically is more effective. Gameplay is smooth too, your shuttle is responsive, your shots and the enemy movements is fast, and the third stage tunnel is challenging without being frustrating. Rugian is not a difficult game, but that might be to its detriment. Not that it doesn't get hard as you progress, but that it's lacking in variety. The stages are relatively short, and there are only a handful of enemy types, and the game allows you to continue after a game over, meaning that even an unskilled player like me can see everything the game has to offer in about the time it takes to watch this video. Yes, after you beat Rugian, you can try all the stages again, only harder, but in some ways the shifting perspective makes them feel discreet, unlike in simpler games like Galaxian or Zaxxon. That's really the downside here. An arcade game needs to be either very simple but engaging, like Space Invaders, Galaxian, Asteroids, Pac-Man, or Tetris, or have a lot more unique content alongside the complexity to avoid feeling short, even if there's no ending. Rugian doesn't quite find a sweet spot to justify continuing to pump quarters into it after beating a single set of stages. You've seen it. You might as well move on to the next cabinet in the arcade. Despite this, as a retro gamer in 2022, I'd say that Rugian is worth playing through at least once, at least to see what it has to offer. I give it a B ranking. Super Locomotive is a 1982 Sega arcade game putting the player in charge of a, well, Super Locomotive. As in Taito's Time Tunnel, which we covered in an earlier video, in Super Locomotive we conduct our train through an environment full of dangerous enemies trying to reach the end bound to travel the tracks, but that's where the similarities end. Where Time Tunnel had a more open design where you controlled your train by activating switches and could traverse a large scrolling playfield, 
In Super Locomotive, you press on ever from left to right, controlling your choice to shift to a different track with the joystick. The effective play field is compressed too. You can see that we have about half the screen to maneuver upon, with the lower half being an animated closer depiction of the action. In fact, I'm only really looking at the lower half now while writing this review. During actual play, my attention was riveted to the top. The aggression of the planes and rival trains is endless. Taking my focus away means a painful crash. The action is certainly more frantic in Super Locomotive. To aid us in defeating and avoiding these enemies, the player has two action buttons. The first fires steam bullets behind us, the second activates a shield that protects us from enemy fire and allows us to plow through most obstacles. Both powers consume our energy, which we can restore by plowing through oil containers sitting on the tracks. I'm not sure that's how trains work, but we're not just a train, we're a super locomotive. Fortunately, running out of energy doesn't kill us, we just can't use our powers until we refuel or beat the stage. After doing so, we're taken to a bonus stage where we fire our steam cannon up at planes passing by overhead. I alluded to this earlier, but Super Locomotive is a much more action-focused title than Taito's Time Tunnel. Simpler, certainly. Beating a stage only requires a certain amount of forward progress compared to the earlier games collecting train cars to open gates, but it feels less satisfying. I tend to compare these games to their contemporaries, and since I gave Time Tunnel a B, I'm going to give Super Locomotive a C. It's not bad, but it's certainly not as engaging. Dodoron is a 1982 arcade maze game from UPL that features a few interesting twists that make it both a unique take on the genre and significantly more difficult in many respects. We post a new one every week, so if that's the kind of thing you're interested in, subscribe to the channel or sign up to the newsletter so you don't miss out. At first glance, Dodoron seems similar to other maze games with a gate system like Mousetrap or Ladybug, but as you can see right away, there are no dots to eat, only enemies, gates, and a few strange symbols. So how do you win? Similar to Qbert, you need to change the color of the gates, and you do this by passing through them. Each pass shifts the colors one step, and in the first stage, one is all you need. By the second, though, the colors cycle, so you can go right past your target white if you're not careful. All the while, you're pursued by enemies, giving you a lot of screen elements to pay attention to. Thankfully, you do have a few powerful on-screen items to help you out. The question marks turn all the enemies into ice cream cones that you can devour, the whirlwind causes all of the gates to spin, potentially knocking foes right off the board, and the fires can kill enemies if you lure them through. They also kill you, so watch out. As I said, this is a difficult game even on the lowest difficulty setting, maybe too tricky for American arcade audiences, which is why it was never distributed to the US. It is innovative and fast-paced if you are a fan of these types of action puzzles, so I'd recommend giving it a try. While it's not my personal cup of tea, I gave Dodoron a B ranking. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to subscribe if you want to see more retro game review and video game history videos.